myself, a double cat, both undergrad and law school. Matt Ryan was Speaker of the House from Pennsylvania for many, many years, and so we are at Villanova Honorary, one of our uh, most famous and best alumni who worked for many years in, in the Pennsylvania government. And the program is also today sponsored by uh, ACS, Augustan Culture Seminar. My name is Dr. Jack Duty, and you can either thank me or criticize me for helping to make you um, a member of the ACS uh, team. Uh, I want to give a particular wonderful shout out to the folks in the Divisions of Freedom Learning Community in O'Dwyer. Welcome folks in O'Dwyer. In many ways, this program is for you today. And I want to thank Brian and, and Andy and David and Fabrice, who have been your teachers both last semester in this, and who have helped organize this event today. Thanks, guys, for, for uh, being part of this today. This talk, as you may know, was once going to be in Ciro one and at the last minute the registrar switched us into this room. The good news is there was a room to switch us in. The bad news is there may have been some people who are in Sear right now and not very happy campers whatsoever. We're talking about a 10 minute walk from Sear down to here. So we started just a minute late to give people a chance to, to, um, to get over the uh, disappointment that they got screwed by the registrar. One hour thought. One hour thought. I take no responsibility for the mistake. Um, we are very lucky today to have as our uh, guest speaker, <coughs> Professor Joseph Desjardins, who is Dean of the College of St. Ben's and St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Desjardins, or as his friends call him, Joe D., graduated and took his doctorate from that s small little school in northern Indiana that's sort of famous for having a golden dome. They once had a football team, and they lost by 18 points last night in Wachovia to the Cats. <laughs> I was there personally to see Villanova um, take, uh, Joe and I were there together watching the game last night. Um, with his doctorate, Joe took his first position at this small little school on the main line whose basketball team is now 19 and 1. And Joe Ooh. came here in 1979 and was here for 11 years and won lots of awards for his work as a teacher and as a scholar. And as a matter of fact, he did such a wonderful job that he wound up leaving us. This is his first official return to Villanova. And this is the first time a faculty scholar has come back to Villanova where the last official act that he performed as a member of the Villanova faculty in 1990 in the summer on Sunday, July the 27th, he played right center field and won his fourth Villanova Summer Softball Championship. <laughs> Joe's skills as a philosopher actually outweigh his skills as a right center fielder. No. <laughs> uh, Joe has been in college over the last 20 years, and he has four years ago been appointed as dean of the college. He works in business ethics and environmental ethics and in social and political philosophy. And while Joe was here, he and I team taught several classes, both intro to philosophy and upper division electives, where we talked about the priority of the good and the right. And Joe has come back to restate his position 20 years later. I am very happy to introduce my very good friend, Professor Joseph Desjardins. That's frightening, that introduction. Thanks, dude. Um, let me see if I can get this rolling first here. In honor of Jack Duty, of course, um, my desktop. Here we go. The boss. Um, just some preliminary comments. Uh, unlike a lot of the, the talks and lectures you, you may go to, uh, this one is not complete. Um, th that is, a, dis despite what Jack just said, I don't have an answer that I'm here to push on you. Um, it's very much a work in progress, so what, what I'd like to do is sort of give you the context of the issues that I'm interested in, what I'm thinking about these days, and, and sort of invite you to walk along uh, with, with me a little bit to think about the issues. Um, so so we'll, we'll get to a certain point and then I'm going to run out of things to say, um, or, or at least run out of things that I, that I think I have um, reasonably defensible thoughts on. And, and I really do hope that, that you'll join in and, and this will be as much a, a, a conversation as anything else. Um, please also feel free to just jump in if you have questions, if, if I'm um, moving along too fast. You know, feel free to raise a hand. Uh, don't, don't feel like you need to be passive sitting there until the end. Um, you'll, you'll die this late in the afternoon if you do that. So, um, you know, s stay involved. Um, let me give you a little bit of uh, context. Um, not on this, but I did have great seats last year. Um, 
if I can get this going here. I also will apologize. I am not uh, terribly technical, technologically advanced. But um, I, I asked my son to help me with a PowerPoint, and he said, "What are you, what are you working on? What's the PowerPoint on?" So well, I'm going to talk a little bit about Plato. We talk about food, um, and and you know, like something to set the theme. And and Michael said, "Well." I couldn't find anything from Plato, but I got another famous Greek, Homer. Would that work? I said yes. <laughs> and so my wise, wise guy son. Um, here's, the, here's the context of, of what, what I'd like to talk about. My own area, as Jack mentioned, ha has been business ethics. Um, I, in fact, taught maybe the first business ethics course here way back in, in the last century. Um, I've been interested in business ethics for 30 years or so, but unlike a lot of what goes on in the field, I've never thought that standard moral philosophy, moral standard ethics, was the right framework uh, to think about business. Um, rather, I've always thought that it's, that it's political philosophy that provides the better way to think about business as a social institution. So, so my approach in that field has been to take the, the, the framework of political theory, political philosophy, and use that uh, f to, to think about business, sort of look at business through the lens of political philosophy. And I've always thought that within political philosophy, the, 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 the question that has been most interesting, the, the question that Jack referred to, um, is this tension between the right and the good. And that, that may be a little familiar to some of you, it may not be. I'll, I'll try to flesh that out a little bit. But, it, but uh, it, it's, the, it's a tension between a classical model of, of, of society, of community, a model that I'll associate with Plato, and the modern worldview, the, the modern view that um, in this presentation I'll, I'll call liberal, the liberal model or liberalism associated with uh, folks from Hobbes through Kant, and I'll talk a little bit about a contemporary philosopher, uh, John Rawls, um, a little bit today. So, so I thought that this, the, the, the proper framework is political philosophy. And one of the most interesting questions within that is the question of, of rights versus goods. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. But ultimately the question is, is there a good way to live a human life? Is there a common good? Or, if not, is liberty, freedom, to choose your own the way to go? And that, that's really been the tension in, in much of Western philosophy for, for millennia. Uh, those like Plato who, who would say there is a common good, and we all ought to live that way, whether we want to or not. And those who say there is no one way to live, no common good, and therefore, we need to let people pretty much choose for themselves. Okay, so that's the, the big context, the big, the big uh, picture. A few years ago, um, uh, a, a friend, a colleague, um, was editing a series of books, and he asked me if I would think about writing a book on the ethics of food. And I thought, that's a really cool topic to write a book on. Um, I don't know anything about it, but what the heck. Um, one way to learn it is to write a book. So, so I started thinking about food and the ethics of food. So here's what you're going to get today. You're going to get a philosopher who wants to think about political philosophy applied to business ethics. And we're going to test that more theoretical, abstract stuff in a real practical case, food. Can we distinguish between good food and not good food. Is there a way objectively to decide what good food is? Or if not, is food to be left to the judgments of individuals? That same debate, same philosophical debate, applied to the practical problem of food, practical issue of food. But then what follows from it? What follows particularly for the role of business in agriculture or, or the food industry? Is that, is that reasonably clear? Okay, so where are we headed? Where do you start when you do the ethics of food? Well, I always start with Plato. Um, why not? Um, 
This quote's from, from uh, the second book of the Republic. Uh, reasonably familiar, you've all read it, studied it hard. Um, here, here's the short version of what's going on. Uh, book one of the Republic. I, I think, by the way, the greatest book in Western civilization history, bar none. You heard it here first. I personally believe Plato was an alien. <laughs> because I can't believe that any human being was this bright. Plato and Aristotle. I think they were both aliens planted here on Earth um, 3,000 years ago, um, 2,500 years ago, because they, they were so bright, and, and nobody's come close. Take it out of my word. The question for Plato is, is, what is justice? And for Plato, that means both. What is justice for me? How should I live my life? And more socially, how should we live together in community? Early in the, in the Republic, Plato says, well, you know, it's really hard to look at a difficult topic on, on a narrow range. I want to know what justice is for the individual. Let me magnify that. Let me give you a theory of justice in the city but realize that this is a magnified version of justice for the individual. So everything I say about the city applies to each of us individually as well. But we'll start by thinking about justice in the city. Where do cities, where do communities come from? And, and here's Plato's answer. Let's create a city from the beginning. And it is our needs, it seems, <clears throat> that will create it. Surely our first and greatest need is to provide food, to sustain life. How will the city adequately provide for that? Should one man be a farmer, another a builder, another a weaver? Should we add a cobbler, craftsman, to look after our physical needs? Really cool start, right? Because with Plato... Book two of the Republic, we get the two fundamental questions, two fundamental philosophical questions about food. What's the difference between what makes, good, what makes food good? How do we know good food from bad food? And how does food get produced? This isn't going to stay there. Come on in, find a seat. Sit up front. Garrison Keeler, Prairie Home Companion, the last people didn't get to sit up on the stage. Right. Plato's initial answer. By what criteria can we distinguish good food? Food that satisfies needs. And what are the socially best means for producing food? Specialization. He goes on to say, essentially, those who have talent should, for, for farming should become farmers. Those who are talented craftsmen should, should build houses. That is, Plato gives us the first version of the socialist dictum. From each according to their needs, to each according to their ability. From each according to their abilities. I used to know that. Right? So Plato lies, lays out his communitarian, commune, communistic view of the state. Everybody should get what they need, and we should produce according to abilities. Okay, thinking about that, <clears throat> it struck me that I don't remember any other philosopher talking systematically about food. As I started to think about this book, I'm thinking, well, there's Plato. Now, who else says something interesting about food? And I go looking, all right, let's look at some contemporary philosophers, and I turn to this fellow, John Rawls, who, who's... Um, in, in the, the philosophical traditions I work in, he's been the most, most influential person the last century, basically. From, from, uh, he, he's an American philosopher, just died recently. Wrote a major book called A Theory of Justice. Rawls talks 300 pages about justice. It doesn't ever mention food. What he mentions, health and vigor, he says that he calls them natural goods. But he talks about the fundamental value, the primary social good that the city should protect is self-respect.
compare to Plato, and, and, and here to set up this, these two views. Imagine the difference between theories of justice. What's the right way to live together? One answer says, a way in which we respect each other as individuals. And Plato, we start working together to produce, to provide our needs, to provide food. For Plato, the city, the community, is a very natural thing. It doesn't, almost doesn't need an explanation. It just is there. Because we are social beings, we work together, we share our work. <laughs> also, Jack tells me you're all reading Hobbes, so I had to throw my man Hobbes in as well. Um, Hobbes very much in the tradition, one of the, one of the first philosophers in this liberal tradition. Um, what are human beings naturally like? Where do, where do societies, where, do this, where does the state come into existence? Hobbes, you know it, when we're living outside of government, without a government, without common power, our lives is a life of war. Every man against every other. Right, I, hopefully you all know the, the quote. And again, Plato. Uh, Plato starts out, we're working together. Why don't you farm... I'll build a house, you make the shoes, you make clothes, and then we'll exchange them. We'll specialize, we'll work together, we'll satisfy our needs. Right? The community is a very natural enterprise. Hobbes, natural, the only thing natural is war. Very different worldviews. Okay, let me, let me push this on a little bit into this framework, speak much framework of the right over the good. The liberal account, the Rawlsian account, if you will. Um, not only have philosophers not talked about food <coughs> roughly for, for a thousand years, but I don't think they've had anything to say about food. That is, I don't think they've said anything about food because food is not a topic of philosophical interest. Because food ultimately is a decision that each of us individually make judgments about. What can I say about food if I'm a philosopher? I like chocolate ice cream. You like vanilla. Okay, end of conversation. I like calamari fried and a little of olive oil and garlic. You like it, you know, sauteed, you like it deep fried. In the liberal model, the, the, the account of what's good is very, very, philosophers would say, very thin theory of the good. There's, there's not much going on. Goodness is a matter of personal choice. And if goodness is a matter of personal choice, Good food is whatever you decide it is. And therefore, as a philosopher, I have nothing to say. Plato, with a much more elaborate, what we call a thick theory of the good, is challenged to articulate it. What makes food good food? Why, in this liberal model, from Hobbes through Rawls, Can't we say anything interesting about good food? <coughs> Philosophical, if you will, the general statement is because there's no rational way to judge good from bad. The reason philosophically we want to focus on rights and justice rather than good is that we don't have a way of judging what's good. Who's to say what's good or bad? and especially about food. Fight in the Dujardin household for, for decades with my kids, right? Eat this food. Why? It's good for you. I don't like it. My sons grew up on cinnamon toast crunch. I would try to get them to eat oatmeal. My sons ate almost all Beige food, <laughs> pasta, 
nothing spicy on it. Potatoes, bananas, ice cream, nothing of color, nothing green. <laughs> and we'd have these arguments. You can't eat this. Why not? I like it. Right? Who are you to say that this is good food? Who are you to say? We would fight it. Right? And, and you all, you're laughing because you all are saying, yeah, you agree. Who's to judge what's good or bad? Hobbes. I love this. I, this quote isn't completely connected, but I love this quote. Hobbes. What's he saying? By manners. <coughs> I mean here not decency of behavior. Like picking your teeth in public. By manners? What do I mean? Those qualities of mankind that concern our living together in peace. Hobbes is in effect equating manners with ethics. How do we get along together? Is for Hobbes not some major philosophical question of justice, but it's like a question of do you put your knives on the right or left side of the plate? It's a matter of etiquette. Why? Is that, is that all that ethics is? Yes, says Hobbes, because there is no such thing as a good common to all of us. The sum, sunum bonum. There is no such thing as the good. There is no good way to live. So we're left with, let's try to get along. It offends me when you pick your teeth in company. Hobbes is an example, right? I find that offensive. So don't do it. It'll help us get along a little bit. For Hobbes, that's an ethical problem, a moral issue. OK. There is no objective grounding for good or bad in this liberal model. From Hobbes, Immanuel Kant, John Rawls. Because goodness isn't in the object. Right? The word means, the objective. If it's objective, you can find it in the object. Well, give me the object and show me where good is. Food. An apple. What's, can you find good in there? It's not in the object. Where does the goodness come in from? The goodness comes in from my judgment of it. You can't have good without a subject to make the judgment. So good and bad is a subjective judgment rather than about the object itself. It's not in the object. All right. Start to bring this down out of the clouds. Now back to my more practical side, business ethics. If good and bad are subjective, then what makes a good business? How do you decide what a good business is from a bad one? In, in our field, we call it a theory of corporate social responsibility. What's a socially responsible business? What's a good business? <clears throat> and you can't say, look at the products they produce, because if you look at the objects, you're not going to find good or bad there. So in business ethics, essentially, <coughs> All models of corporate social responsibility, let me just get all of this there. One more. Um, of, of, there's a range of theories out there in corporate social responsibility. They range from a sort of narrow model, an economic model. The only responsibility of business is to pursue profits within the law. Why pursue profit? Because a profitable business is a business that satisfies consumer demand. Doesn't say anything about what consumers are demanding, right? But you're a good business if you give people what they want. And if you do it efficiently. Because you're getting as much good, that is, subjective preferences out there as you can. And do it within the law. Whatever the law is. 
does it make sense to, to, for me to claim that that's a, a, a pretty formal account of, of justice or social responsibility? It doesn't tell you anything about the content. It doesn't tell you anything about what the business is producing. And it doesn't tell you anything about what the law says. It just says, as long as you're satisfying consumer demand, giving people what they want efficiently, and obeying the law, you're doing what's socially responsible. That's one theory. And then they move along a continuum. People will add things like, well, you should respect the rights of, of consumers. You should respect the rights of employees. You should respect the rights of stakeholders. So the most extensive theory of corporate social responsibility says business has a responsibility to respect the rights of all kinds of stakeholders. Employees, consumers, competitors, the society, the environment, listen. Whatever those rights are. That, in a nutshell, is what keeps business ethicists busy for decades. Therefore, again, coming down out of the clouds a little bit more, testing this theory and some, some practical issues. What about food? When is a food business or an agricultural business socially responsible? On this view, it's whenever it's satisfying the demands of consumers, giving people what they want. What's good food? Whatever people want. What's a socially responsible business? One that satisfies the demands in the marketplace. Supply should be a function of demand. Consumers are autonomous, free individuals to choose for themselves what they want. They express those preferences in the market. Business satisfies those. And if you're doing it efficiently, you make a profit. And obey the law. Is, is that, let me back off a little bit. I'm, I'm throwing a lot at you at the start, but reasonably clear. Yes, sir. Crystal. Uh, uh, one question. It, it seems as if here the production and consumption are conflated. Um, on, on, on sort of this model, what gets produced is a function of what consumers are demanding. Okay. Right. So that, that's all I would mean by that. Um, now, now, obviously, the, the interesting philosophical, psychological question, um, practical marketing question, is that true? <coughs> How many consumers were, you know, demanding the flexible iPad that came out yesterday? Was this produced in response to the market or not? But the, you know, there's an interesting, interesting question. Yes, sir. Uh, this model it doesn't take into account at all the manner by which something become productive. Or yeah, yeah. Th that's a real good question. Um, I think I think the, the the question was, does this model not take into account the the means of production, if you will, how things get produced? And I think typically the answer is, as long as it's produced in a way that respects the law. Is it legal? And that would be a narrow view. And then maybe respects the rights of. So for example, um, uh, uh, production in offshore uh, uh, child labor kinds of situations. Um, one argument would be to say, well, is it legal or not? May not be, child labor is illegal in the United States, so it would be socially irresponsible to do it here. Legal in another setting socially responsible to do it there. So, th so that would be the, the, the issue is a function of law and, and more expansively maybe rights. But otherwise there's no right way to produce things. There's no good way versus bad way to produce. As long as it's efficient. And Who decides what kind of rights work? That, that's one of the basic questions of business ethics. What rights do people have? Um, what, what the, the first thing I published to try to get tenured here 20 years ago was, was some uh, writing on employee rights. Do employees have rights against their employers other than what the law says? 
the, let me just say that that's a, that's a live issue of who decides what those rights are, if there are rights, and, and that, that's what philosophers and ethicists argue about. Obviously, other than legal rights. Okay. Just I mean, that, that's, take a business ethics class. That, hopefully, that's one of the things you talk about in, in debate. Okay. So, question. Is this very persuasive? Do you buy this approach? What if we could establish a rational criteria for judging good and bad? Right? This whole modern liberal view comes out of a tradition that says there's no way to judge. I point the finger ultimately at Galileo for that. But there's no way of knowing the good because there is no good that is essential to objects. Who can say? Can't say. The live question that I that I really want to want us to want you to join me with today is can we? Can we know? Can you give a rational defensive account of good and bad? In this example, food. Is there a rational way for deciding what food is good food? Our liberal answer is, of course, no. Right? Good food is a matter of taste. Tastes are subjective, personal. Therefore, good food is subjective. Up to you. It's the quote from Hobbes when Hobbes talks about reason. Just ask you, can we give a rational account of what's good? And there's the basis of Hobbes' answer. No. Because what's reason? Reason is nothing more than calculating a means to an end. But reason cannot judge the end itself. That's a matter, for Hobbes, of desires, of passions. You choose where you want to go. Reason can tell you how to get there. You want to go to New York City. Reason can tell you how best to get there. Jump on Amtrak, jump on 95. What's the most efficient way? Reason can calculate consequences. If you go this way, it'll cost you this. So reason for Hobbes is this balancing of consequences. <coughs> But reason has no role in saying, don't go to New York. That's not a good place to go to. Reason can't get inside your, your desires, your ends, and judge them as good or bad. It can't tell you it's bad to want Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It'll say, if you want it, go down to the Acme, spend three bucks. Yeah. So in, in this modern view, reason is, is what philosophers often call instrumental. It's a means. It's an instrument. But there's nothing left. Therefore, what? What can we say about business? The food business. Food industry, which is an interesting phrase, isn't it? Food industry. Agriculture. Well, their role is to respond to the demands of the market. If I am a farmer, I now live in, in the middle of farm country, what should I produce? The answer is very straightforward. Where's the market? Should I plant soybeans this year or corn? About all they grow in Minnesota. What's the price per bushel? Okay. Well, let's then play with Plato a little bit. Let's see what he might say. Oh, no. You know what? I've got a fun thing for you. Let me just run through this a little bit. Ooh. My son. The liberal market model. How do you judge good food? What are the options? I mean, look around you. How do we, in the U.S. of A. here in the 21st century, judge good or bad food production? Popularity. 10 billion sold. 
This is an absolute true story. The first time I, I started working on this project, a few years ago, in my, my hometown of scenic St. Cloud, Minnesota, right in the middle of Lake Wobegon, they opened the first International House of Pancakes restaurant in St. Cloud. Drive down the main drag of St. Cloud and you'll see every fast food restaurant in the world within eight blocks. Opened up the first International House of Pancakes restaurant in St. Cloud. The first long weekend it was open, Thursday through Sunday, they sold 22,000 meals at International House of Pancakes. There are only 80,000 people in the St. Cloud region. <laughs> One out of four people had a meal at International House of Pancakes within the first four days it was open. Success. That's a good restaurant, right? Right? We had 22,000 people in a weekend. Eight pancakes. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch, dinner. It's open 24 hours, so you can understand why they can. All right, popularity, quantity. Thanks for my son. Supersized portions. What's good food? Uh, again, and, and I don't mean to pick on my, my new adopted hometown, because I'm sure it's true here as well. Go out to dinner at a restaurant and order a meal. Have you ever finished the meal? Last night, I just happened to get in in time to go to a basketball game. Friend Dan Regan and another friend, Hank Nichols, took me out to dinner. We go to South Philly for some good pasta. We don't get pasta in Minnesota. Ordered appetizers that could feed half of the state. Honest to God, as Ani Pasta came out and, and, and Hank said, is this for the table? She said, no, it's your appetizer. I couldn't eat this in three days. Honest to God, huge play. I mean, think of how people, wow, let's go to McDonald's. Super size, for only another 15 cents, I can get a gallon of soda. <laughs> My other all-time favorite, all you can eat. There's, there's, a, there's a Chinese restaurant right where I turn heading home every night. All you can eat buffet, $11.95. Good food. They just celebrated their 25th anniversary. And, and, and again, I'll pick on St. Cloud, but, um, and price. All of these, right, are formal, empty criteria. They don't say anything about the food. They say more, cheap, lots, popular. They don't say anything about quality. Right? That, that the, the, the platonic criticism of the modern world, at least this modern world, is that it's lost the language to talk about quality. We, we don't know what to say about food. It's good. It's a lot. It's cheap. All you can eat, eleven ninety five. Is it good? Yeah. Okay. You should be getting a little nervous now, right? Because, because this is a real sort of classical critique of our culture. Right? The culture that knows the cost of everything but the value of nothing. That's how we live, right? I live this way. Oh yeah, my all-time other favorite, convenience. Is it good food? Yeah, I don't even have to stop my car to eat it. <laughs> you know, drive through windows. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Jack Duty a little bit today. Got in his car, he's driving a nice BMW, you know, must be nice. Um, he said, it's so goofy. You can barely get to the beverage holder. Now, I moved to Minnesota because my wife, God bless her, is the fourth generation of a family, runs a family business. Happens to be a Volkswagen dealership. And her father was retiring, and she gave me an option to come with her and the kids or stay with my friends here in Philadelphia. And 20 years later, you get the story. 
until very recently, Volkswagens did not put beverage holders in their cars. Why? Because you Americans are bizarre to eat and drink while you're driving. You drive for driving at 180 miles an hour in the Autobahn. And when you eat, stop. Sit down. Spend some time. I mean, it, it, the, for the Germans, quite literally, it was a, a, a they, they gave in. They lost the fight. You now get a double cup holder in a VW. But they didn't want to do it. They consciously did not do it. They didn't want to cave into the American <coughs> convenience market. But now Jack has his BMW and he can put his morning coffee in the side and drink and drive. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not making this up. Of course, we always have the law to tell you what's right. Can't be dangerous. All right, so humor me and play with me a little bit on, on what Plato would say about this. How are we doing for time? We're okay. Right after, in book two, when Plato starts forming this just community, the ideal community, and, and it's really a thought experiment. He said, let's just think along together. What would an ideal city be like? No constraints. We can imagine anything we want. What is the ideal city? We just allocate responsibilities. You be a farmer, you be a shoemaker, you build houses. And then he says, what will people be like in that city? And here's how he starts to describe them. They will eat barley meal and wheat flour, kneading them, making noble cakes and loaves. These they will serve up on a mat of reeds or in clean leaves themselves while reclining upon beds strewn with myrtle. <laughs> Some people in this room of a certain generation remember a bunch of hippies living in communes, organic farmers. That's it. Right? Go to the farmer's co-op, go to the local co-op, and what are you going to find? You're going to find whole grains, barley meal, wheat flour. Were any of you smacking your lips when you heard that? Oh man, I can't wait to have a barley meal cake. <laughs> And, but that's very much the image that Plato does, right? Cities begin by satisfying needs. And what do you need? You need healthy, organic, whole grains. That's about it. Right? That, that's very much the image that Plato gives us at the, at, at the start. Good food is the food that satisfies your needs. That's why cities were started in the first place, to satisfy our needs. And what's our need? Our need is for nutritious food. Plato, at this point, is speaking with um, so in, in, the, in, the, in the Republic. Socrates is the character, and he's speaking to one of Plato's brothers, uh, Glaucon. And Glaucon <laughs> says to him, Plato, where's the relic? You've just described a pretty boring life. Who wants to live on a commune eating whole grains, lying on grass all day? It's boring. Um, I'm just going to run through this. Uh, I'm, I'll play with this a little bit. I want to talk about needs and interests in a little bit. But Glaucon says, Socrates, where's the relish? boring barley meals and Socrates or Plato being as sarcastic as ever says oh yeah I forgot we need some relish we should have some salt and olives and cheese and then boiled roots and herbs as country people prepare we should have some desserts some figs some pastries so Plato, Socrates, plays, plays the wise guy. And he says, oh, you want relish? I'll give you some relish. Let's have some relish and some mustard and some olives on your, you know, barley leaf loaves. Right? What's he saying? He's saying that satisfying our needs is not enough, says Glaucon. Getting what you need is not enough for a good life. 
if we're designing this ideal community from the start, and all we have are organic whole grains, that's not a good human life. We need more than that. We need more than just what we need. We want a little flourish, a little pizzazz, some relish. And Plato goes on to describe a city with relish. Let me give you actually some of, some of the, the whole quote. Let us consider first of all, what will be their way of life? Will they not produce grain and wine and clothes and shoes? And where they are housed, they will work in the summer, comfortably stripped and barefoot, but in the winter, adequately clothed and shod. And they and their children will feast, drinking the wine that they have made, wearing garlands on their heads, and singing the praises of the gods, happy to converse with one another. And they will take care of their families and not exceed their means, having an eye to poverty or war. And they will not exceed their means, looking out for poverty and war. Plato's second answer. Right? First answer is, give people what they need, that's a good society. Glaucon says, no, that's not enough. We need more than that. And Plato says, all right, how about this? Get what you need, you get a little pizzazz, a little relish, but not too much more. Not too much more. What you're looking to do is balance poverty not having enough. And our dear friend Hobbes, <coughs> having too much is going to lead to war, he suggests. And let me give you my other favorite quote from dear Tom Hobbes. <coughs> Felicity. We don't have language like that. Great word, Felicity. Happiness. What's happiness, Hobbes? Happiness is the continual progress of the desires from one object to another. I know what that means for me. Happiness is the continual progress of desires from one object to another. The attaining of the former being still but the way to the latter. Happiness isn't getting what you want. Happiness is striving for what you want. And whenever you get it, striving for more. It's the continual movement towards getting what you want. And any time you get what you want, guess what? You want something more. Now, how many of you have charge cards? How many of your students have charge cards? Do you know what the interest rate is? Just check it. Just check it. What happened with the subprime mortgage collapse? What was driving that? Here's my take. I'm really going to dump on students today. My take is people who graduate college thought that they should have a house. Couldn't afford it, but bought one. And then in a few years thought you needed a bigger house. So you leverage the first one, buy the second one, which you then leverage to buy the third and fourth and fifth and eighth one. Right? This continuous demand for more. What I want to suggest here is a tension between Plato's model of having enough and Hobbes' model of 
quite literally never having enough. Because you're never going to be happy if you stop desiring. If happiness is pursuing what you want, the minute you're satisfied, you're unhappy. There was a time, and I'm going to make believe I know a little bit about economic history. <coughs> um, early 20th century, when a number of economists were wor worried about the fact that the American standard of living had increased so much in the industrial age that people were going to stop working. That the industrial revolution had raised people so quickly and so far out of poverty <coughs> that they wouldn't have to work much anymore, or as much. And what happens if people stop working? What happens if people stop working less, start working less? Demand decreases. Demand decreases. And then what happens? Supply decreases. Then you start laying people off because you there's no demand out there. When you start laying people off, demand decreases more. So that was, a, that was thought to be a real problem, that we've become so affluent that people are going to slow down. They've got enough. Didn't happen. Right? Didn't happen. Never have enough. We've got to demand more and more and more. Hobbes' view, Hobbes' view of economics, Hobbes' view of, of ethics, of business ethics. Now, back to Plato. This society, the city we've just designed. It's a city in which people have what they want and have some relish. They're happy. Glaucon calls it a city of pigs. Glaucon says, do you think that's a good city? Do you think that's justice? Do you think that's how we should live our lives? With wine and relish and food? That's a city of pigs. That's not human good. That's animalistic good. Getting what you want, getting some tasty things, that's not enough. That's a city of animals but not humans. And then Plato answered, offers his third answer. <coughs> this also is real fun. I, I you know, won't bore you to read it all, but it's worth looking at. Ah, I understand. I get it now, says Socrates. When looking for the city, for the just city, we should, be, we should be concerned not just with any city, but the city of luxuries, the luxurious city. It's not a bad idea, <coughs> because it's probably going to be in the city of luxuries where we find issues of justice and injustice. Remember what his alternative is. Earlier alternative was an alternative in which we get our needs, we have a little bit of fun, some relish, but not too much. Glaucon says, that's still not enough. We need luxuries. Humans need more than just physical needs and a little bit of taste. And Socrates says, ah, it's the luxurious city in which justice and injustice comes. My mistake. I thought we were talking about the true and healthy city. But I see we're not. Yeah, right? He's saying what I just described was the true city, the just one, the healthy one. But that's not enough for you, Glaucon. Not enough. You want the feverish city. The sick one. Right? The city of luxuries is, Plato seems to be suggesting, a sick city, a feverish one. All right, I see you're not going to be satisfied with my simpler way of life. You want luxury. 
So let's add to it. Let's keep building the city. More than food and relish, we're going to add sofas and tables and furnitures and dainties and perfumes. Here's a real idea of Greek life, right? Incense, courtesans, pastries, all those cool things. And we must go beyond the needs that we started with, such as houses and clothes. And we now need the arts of the painter and the embroiderer and so forth and so on. Plato just described the creature comforts of consumer society. Right? Getting more. Let me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to slow down a little bit and start asking some questions. But here's Glaucon's view. Glaucon. The just city is the city that meets our needs. It's a city that moves beyond consumer desires. Because that would be a city of pigs. It's a city of culture. Glaucon's view. It's a city where we have the finer things in life. Embroidery. Art. Sofa. Furniture. It's a city where you don't shop at Walmart. You shop out on the main line someplace. That, that, as it turns out, that's who Glaucon is. Glaucon is the aristocrat. And Glaucon saying, the good city is not the city of merely creature comforts. Creature comforts is the city of pigs. The good city has higher ambitions than that. Seeks higher goods than mere needs and creature desires. The city, the good city, is the city of the educated. That short, short version is why you're all here, at least in theory. Why go to a college of arts and sciences? Why go to a liberal arts school? I think most of you are in college of arts and science, right? No? no. What's the difference between going to take a, majoring in, in philosophy in majoring in finance. Why would society ever create universities rather than job training schools? <coughs> what are universities trying to teach you? I'd go on to play a little bit with the notion of liberal arts. Why do they call them the liberal arts? <coughs> <coughs> what are you supposed to learn here? Please don't say, get a job. Why are you taking courses in political theory and philosophy and revising the curriculum for pretty soon, maybe not fine arts, but maybe? Theater. Why? What should the difference between be between a college educated person and one who's not? Knowledge. I'm sorry? Knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of what? There's a great question. Knowledge. I think you're absolutely right. Knowledge. Of what? Culture. <coughs> Knowledge of culture. How about this? Knowledge of good and bad. Knowledge of what's good. Knowledge so that when you go out there, you will enjoy good things, like food, <coughs> rather than just anything. How's that? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back off in a second, I promise. Plato says, those aristocrats those people who do have knowledge of the finer things in life, those people who do have knowledge of culture, the finer things, they are like philosophers.
Because Glaucon's saying, we've just described the just city, I think. And it's a city in which people like me, people of, well, of good training, of culture, aristocratic people, are the rulers. Right? Isn't that what we just described, Plato? And Plato says, not quite. The just city is a city ruled by, thank you very much, philosophers. And Glaucon says, didn't I just describe them? There are people who know good things. And Plato says, you're pretty close. The philosopher does have knowledge. But the philosopher knows not just good things, but the philosopher knows the good. Now, that's sort of the end of, of where I wanted to push you. Now I want to would tease out from you some thinking. Bring it back down out of the clouds and ask you, can we get on account of the good life? Let's just start with the... I want to suggest there are two levels here. There's Glaucon, the aristocrat, the good life. And then there's a potential higher level. The philosopher's good. So let's start with the good life. Humor me. Can you judge good and bad? Very practical issue. About food. Where I want to go with this in business is can we say that some products ought not to be produced? <coughs> Why not? Because they're bad. This alternative of corporate social responsibility, a platonic model, says that a business is responsible not just by re replying to the market, but by producing good things. What do you think? Stop for a minute. What do you think? Really, honestly. Sure. Proclivities, my judgment. Sure. Do you ever want to say to somebody, you're wrong about taste? Again, I want to stay with food as just a real kind of fun, gutsy example. What's your favorite food? Pizza. Pizza. Is that good food? Uh, Can there be good pizza? <coughs> Is there bad pizza? Yes. What's the difference? <laughs> What's the difference? I'm going to stay over here for a minute. I want to talk to my friends over here this week. Um, what, what's bad pizza? <coughs> bad about pizza? What, no, what's a bad pizza? <coughs> Like, sometimes in this market they don't put sauce in this one type of pizza. <laughs> pizza without sauce. <laughs> you, know, you know the example Plato uses? Right, I'm not making this up. This is right out of Plato. You know the example, one of the first examples he turns to is wine. What's good wine? Strong. <laughs> Get you where you want to go. <laughs> Morgan David 2020, Catawba Pink, Boone's Farm Apple. I'm going through the list of the wines I drink as an undergraduate. <laughs> Boone's Farm Apple Wine. Can you make qualitative judgments about wine? All right, you're not wine drinkers. How about beer? <laughs> Miller Golden Draft Light Water Coors Michelob. Good beer? Good beer, anybody? Budweiser? Yangling. Is it a matter of taste? Is it in the object? Can you learn <coughs> good and bad with food? Is it, is it a matter of knowledge? Can you learn? Can you be taught 
That's a, that. Ooh, can virtue be taught? They asked Socrates. Um, can you? Your question was, can you figure it out yourself by learning? Do I mean figure it out yourself or being taught by others? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I honestly don't know. What would it? What would it be to have knowledge of good food? What would that involve? Well, maybe I could do the opposite. Knowledge of bad food could start as a minimum of food, or especially wine or beer, that makes me feel sick the next day somehow. <clears throat> okay. Or a wine that gives me a headache, or makes me wake up with a headache every time. Okay. So, so maybe poisonous food. Would would would, would you would you accept that? Food you eat and you. Fall over sick. Bad food? I think there may be a way to say whether it's good food because, like, think about like you could say that's really good lasagna, but maybe you don't like melted cheese, but you acknowledge that it's still it's a good lasagna. So like, there's there must be some way. Really interesting question, right? Is there a difference between liking something, desiring it, and judging it as good? Right. Great question. Does it make sense to say, this is good wine, but I don't like it? But it's good. Or is it only good if you like it? That one example, I think, uh, when they do it, a lot of people say is that it's really expensive. It's a good wine. You might hate it. You right. Might say it's good wine. right, right. And do you see that answer goes right up with the all you can eat answers? Right? I don't know much about art, but it, this must be good if it sells for $20 million and it's a painting. I don't know good wine, but I'll start up here on the top <coughs> shelf. I've got to bring a bottle of wine to a friend's house for dinner, so I'll start up here with the expensive stuff. Right? There's, that's the Hobbes answer, the cloud kind of answer, the consumer society answer. That's good, but it's just good marketing. It, it, <laughs> right, it's good marketing which is a way of getting somebody to do something. Right? But let's come back to that question. I, I love that question. It's just a, a great question. Give that person a name. Does, does it, literally, does it make sense to you? Does it, is, it, is it at all sensible to say, this is good, but I don't want it, or I don't like it, and... I like this, but it ain't good. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you could say that because uh, food can be destructive of a person's health, for example. Yeah. And um, America has the highest rate of obesity in the world. And why is that? I mean, clearly it's because they're eating bad food. That's, that's, that's part of the answer. Yeah. Why is that food bad? Why do we say it's bad? Because the effect of that food is to make people, dis, in, a, in a sense, um, to cause a lot of uh, unpleasantness and a lot of dysfunction in people's lives. In the sense that, you know, they can't even get around necessarily, they, they lose their, they're not able to walk or run maybe. Diabetes. Um, diabetes. There's diabetes. all sorts of illnesses right. that come from this diet that we're right. on. So I don't know, I mean, that might be one way of thinking about whether it's good or bad. Health, its effect on health. How, how about that? What, what do you all think? I think that's um, pretty much uh, the way that Plato described it. He described it as meeting your needs. So food that doesn't meet your needs for health yeah. would be food that's... Right. Food that doesn't meet your needs for health would be bad food. How's that? No, I'm going to keep the philosophers out of it for a while. We'll argue this over dinner. Over oh, good food. Right. right. <laughs> we're going out for a very good dinner. I mean, lots of butter. <laughs> lots of butter. Maybe good. Right. Well, where am I going with this? Well, what's the future, in general, of business? Where ought, an ethical question, where should business be headed? 
narrower example, where should food, agricultural business, be headed? If you were starting a restaurant or a farm, what food would you produce? How would you produce it? The question was asked earlier. Are there good ways to produce food? Um, I would produce whatever provided me with the most profit in the most efficient manner. Because then I'd be able to satisfy my own needs with the profit that I'm living. Yeah. Profit the answer. You know what you know what the most profitable uh, grain is in Minnesota? Corn. Feed corn. And and I and it has to be both, because if you've never seen it. My mistake when I first moved out there was to actually take an ear of corn off our, you know, feed corn. It's not fit for human consumption. It's fit for cows. Very profitable. Right? There's the, there's the modern answer. But in response to that, that's just the best good for the human. I mean, that's not good for the environment, for the animal, potentially, depending. So how do you reconcile Good. I mean, are you just looking at good in terms of good for humans, or good for the whole society? Yeah. You tell me. Why does anybody care about a book on the ethics of food now? Why, why, why do they? Why, why does some publisher want a book on the ethics of food? Should we ban trans fats? Right. I mean, think of think of the issues: health issues on food. Environmental issues on food. The issue, the, the, the general area, I'll, I'll lay my own, my own sort of partisan cards on the table. I'm interested in thinking about sustainable business. Business that can be long-term profitable and environmentally sustainable. What would that be? Is it solely responding to consumer demand? Or are there other value questions to consider? That's why, and you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of letting you know where, where my, my own views are. That's why I'm interested in Plato. Is there a way of judging good that's enough to avoid poverty and boring lives, but not so much that we all become Hobbesian? That is, can you get in and make qualitative judgments about, again, as an example, food, but more generally, products. Real question. Is it, is it safe to rely on the demands of consumers to determine good and bad products? Yes. <coughs> Plato, right? The, the tension is, do you trade off the freedom of choice found in democracies against what sure looks like a more authoritarian view that says, I know what's good, whether they're aristocrats or philosophers? But we don't necessarily want to make that leap right away without talking about it, do we, between what's good and what's not? that we should individually think it through or try to understand it, and whether government should impose it on society. Right. Be because w what, what's the alternative, right? Is it education? Right? Is it, it and, and I think ultimately that would have to be Plato's answer. Learning, being taught the good from the bad. The problem isn't people doing what they want, it's that their wants are non-rational. How's that? I, it, it, again, I, I mean this as, as, a, as an honest, open question. But if you, you get those overseers telling you what's good, yeah. but then you, you try it and you don't like it, so then it isn't good for you. Yeah. So it's not good because you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be taught? I, 
I tell a story again, I'll make fun of Jack Duty. When I came here, right, I was just a poor grad student, grew up blue collar, I didn't know anything. Jack taught me all I know. <coughs> One of the first things he taught me was to distinguish between good wine and bad wine. I would drink the wine he served and I'd say, mm -hmm. I don't like this. And he would say, let me tell you about it. Ever watch any of the food shows on TV? Did you ever learn anything from it? Can taste be taught? Can you learn it? Can you reason about it? Yeah, the, the, the response was it can't be taught, but you might be persuaded. Uh, you certainly can be manipulated. Good marketing might convince you that it's good. Yeah. Speaking of food, Speaking the of dining food. halls the close dining halls. in a little while. And some people need some food. And there's a class that's going to be in here in five minutes. So I want to thank <laughs> Joe for an excellent presentation.